Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hewitt Shaw, the President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today Lanny Davis, who served as a special counsel to President Clinton from 1996 to 1998 and as a spokesperson for the President on many important issues over the years. In retrospect, those seem like calmer and simpler times, don't they? And it is from that experience Mr. Davis will speak with us today about crisis management generally, including discussions about the ongoing struggles of governing in today's environment. Presently, Mr. Davis at his firm, Lanny J. Davis and Associates, provides legal, media, legislative, and crisis management advice and counsel to individuals and companies with an array of issues ranging from governmental investigations to highly publicized accusations of improper and sometimes illegal behavior. With his background in government service and with his current professional multidisciplinary practice, he is particularly well suited to speak on today's topic. His approach to utilizing integrated legal, media, and lobbying approaches has often provided to his clients quicker, less expensive and more successful outcomes than may result from protracted litigation and other purely legal maneuvers. He is a frequent speaker and author of several books, including his recently published book, Crisis Tales, Five Rules for Coping with Crisis in the Business, Politics, and Life. And we have copies in the lobby for your purchase at the end, if you're interested. Uh, it was on the occasion, in fact, of the celebration of the release of this new book that President Clinton remarked uh, as follows. Many people specialize in dealing with the media, understanding politics, or navigating the legal system. Lanny is unique in his mastery of all three. He's one of America's most skilled and experienced advisors, and the fact that he has so many friends on both sides of the aisle is a testament to his fair-minded approach to problem solving and his remarkable record of success. On a personal note, as if Lanny needs more of an um, endorsement than from a former president, I would add that as a cable news junkie myself, uh, of all of the networks, uh, irrespective of whether I happen to agree or not with uh, Mr. Davis on his particular view from time to time, he's one of the few commentators uh, on both sides of the aisle that I find myself tuned into right to the end out of my respect for his tone of civility and his fair-mindedness and intellectual honesty, uh, which he brings to any discussion. He is a prime example of the goal of our city club to bring strongly held views in a thoughtful, respectful, and civil discourse, which ultimately is the best path to effective resolution of conflicting positions. Lanny is a graduate of, a graduate of Yale University, both undergraduate and law school, and served as a litigator at a large DC firm before uh, joining the White House. After his White House service, in addition to his practice at his current firm, President George W. Bush appointed him to serve on the five-member Privacy and Silver Liberties Oversight Board created by Congress as part of the 2005 Intelligent Re Intelligence Reform Act, further indicating the bipartisan respect Lanny enjoys at the highest levels of our government. Please join me now in welcoming to the City Club podium, Lanny Davis. Uh, thank you all. This is such a, a great honor to be in such a historic organization, and I am really uh, moved that I was invited to be here, and the notion of a lot of Republicans surrounding me and applauding me is even more moving. <laughs> I did want to do a personal uh, couple of comments about some people in the audience before I talk a little bit serious about politics in Washington and kind of bridging over to the book I wrote. Uh, but first I'd like to uh, introduce my two cousins who are residents of Rocky River, Cleveland, all my life. I haven't seen them for many years, uh, but uh, Larry Gilbert and Christine Gilbert, I'm going to use her Gilbert name, not her married name, are, are right here in front of me. And then I promised that I would completely, 100% embarrass 
somebody that I consider to be as close as a brother possibly could be, since we only see each other about once every 25 years. Uh, he has a rather unknown last name, Taft. And uh, Rick Taft, sitting in front of me, helped co-educate Yale University. And anything else I might say about Rick and all of his life's achievements, the fact that he brought, helped me on a crusade to bring women to Yale, it will be our eternal legacy. So good to see you, Rick. <laughs> and finally, on uh, the theme of uh, purple, I created uh, with Michael Steele of the um, different cable channel. I'm associated with Fox as a liberal Democrat. He's associated with MSNBC as a former Republican uh, National Party chairman. He's a conservative, I'm a liberal. He's wrong about almost everything. <laughs> but we came together because we are brothers uh, in uh, the belief that there is uh, an important, especially today, maybe more than ever before, for conversation between people who disagree. And there is always going to be disagreement, but there's an ability to have a conversation rather than a food fight. And Michael Steele and I, deciding that that was important, uh, created an organization called Purple Nation Solutions. And that's exactly as it describes red state and blue states combined to purple. And solutions are the only way that you can govern. You have here in the state of Ohio a very conservative uh, Republican, I used to be very conservative and also commentator and host of a Fox television show after he served in Congress named John Kasich. And apart from the fact that Kasich is wrong about everything, he's a gentleman, he's a great leader, and uh, I don't know if I can urge you to vote for him, but I certainly think if you do, you, you can't be all that wrong. So my respects to the governor of your state. I also uh, pay my respects uh, to your mayor and the head of your school board, and I understand even the head of your organized labor a group here in Cleveland who have proven that you can work together on school reform and a very dear friend of mine who was your Secretary of State, Jennifer Bruner, I believe out of Columbus, uh, is also the kind of purple Democrat that I deeply respect. So now that I've given you the kumbaya of the opening, let me tell you how bad things are right now in Washington and uh, why I am uh, somewhat pessimistic that they're not going to get any better soon. Unless the broad American middle of center left and center right citizens, and I think if you think of a football field, it is an accurate statement based on polling, much less my instincts, that the 20-yard uh, line to the goalpost are pretty much not going to listen to anything said by the other side, and vice versa, 20-yard line to the goalpost. But that leaves 60 yards of a football field, and that is the American people. And somewhere between those 20-yard lines, there is a there are solutions to our problems. And there are some amazingly common and well understood solutions that are as obvious as just at doing the math. Uh, I start with one that left and right seems to have in common. Uh, and the American people, as usual, are way ahead of Washington. But because we're so dysfunctional in Washington and we can't have this type of a conversation, uh, we're not uh, making any progress. In fact, things are getting worse. And that is the issue of the national debt and spending more money every year, burying us into a deeper hole of debt. It may sound that I'm talking as a conservative, since I'm a definite raise your taxes, big spending, big government Democrat. But I also think that's gotten us into trouble. And I do think that Republicans have been complicit in a philosophy of using credit cards rather than spending the money that we have and not more than the money that we have. You heard that I was appointed to the Privacy and Civil Liberties Board created by the 9-11 Commission by a Republican president named George W. Bush. Now, one person in the room, namely uh, Mr. Taft, knows that my friendship with George W. Bush goes back to our Yale days. And no, we did not inhale when we went to Yale. <laughs> But we did uh, belong to the same fraternity, and I did vote for George Bush for president of my fraternity. <laughs> and I stayed in touch with him through thick and thin, 
in both of our lives had some thick and both of our lives had some thin. And we remained friends. And uh, I was uh, certainly unhappy when he was elected president because I was supporting the other guy. But I was happy for him and happy for America because I knew that he had great character and that uh, he is a listener and very, very likable. And through his presidency, I kept telling, I have a second family, two older children. Uh, if you like college basketball, by the way, my son is Seth Davis on CBS doing the NCAA tournament, and I'm introduced nowadays as the father of Seth Davis. So your listening audience uh, will see Seth uh, for the ne next couple of weeks doing the NCAA, and you might see uh, an older looking man with slightly gray hair, I think, uh, holding up a sign saying, I'm Seth Davis's father. <laughs> um, but uh, I have a younger uh, crew of children. I have two older. I have a 14-year-old and an 8-year-old and six grandchildren. Now, that's a long story I'm not going to tell. <laughs> but the story about George Bush, which then leads me to tell you a little bit about how we solved the dysfunction in, in Washington, is really about the nature of why it's possible for a conservative Republican, and he certainly was and is, George W. Bush, and myself, old friends, but I'm as liberal a Democrat as you can find. Maybe on fiscal issues, I'm said to be conservative, but I really don't think it's conservative to say that I shouldn't be handing credit card receipts over to my children saying, you pay for my trip around the world. That isn't liberal or conservative. That's just plain wrong. And that's what the, just this generation is doing. Well, my friend George Bush is partly responsible for that. Bill Clinton left office, not just because I'm a friend of the Clintons and a supporter of the Clintons, uh, inherited a deficit and left office with $1 trillion in surplus. It's hard to remember that we had a trillion dollars more than we needed in 2001 on January 20th when he left office. And after my friend George Bush left office with two wars paid for by credit cards, whether you like the wars or not, you pay for them if they're important to the national interest. We did not pay for them. We borrowed money to pay for them. And we also did a very good thing, which is to add prescription drug benefits to Medicare. But we used a credit card. We did not pay for that. And all of my fellow Democrats who talk about social programs and helping the needy and all the things that we all think Democrats stand for decided all those things were important as long as we didn't pay for them. We would have to borrow to pay for them. And so I became very strong on the subject of the morality of that judgment not to pay for the bills, to hand them over to our children. I guess I'm more strongly sensitive about that topic because I have a 14-year-old and an 8-year-old who I'm handing over my credit card receipts to as a generation, uh, figuratively, maybe sometimes literally. So it is a bipartisan problem. Democrats and Republicans have both done it because it's easier to say yes than it is to ask the American people to pay for what they want. And everybody in Washington has a reason why my program should be used with borrowed money, but the other person's isn't as important. Everybody's got a good argument. And then when it comes time for the piper to pay, and we're almost there, we will be approaching the point where we will be paying $1 trillion in interest on what will be $23 trillion of debt if the president's program is enacted as written, if Paul Ryan's program is enacted as written, a conservative program and a liberal program enact either one of those, we will have $6 trillion more of debt under either one. Ryan, we would argue as Democrats, is more debt because he doesn't want to raise revenues. He just wants to cut. President Obama claims to be balanced, but in fact is raising more revenues and isn't taking the real cuts that are going to save this uh, unsustainable debt, which is to entitlement programs changing the basic structure of Medicare and Social Security is simply inevitable. It's only a question of when. And two very brave men, one who I know extremely well, who I worked for in the White House, Erskine Bowles, and Alan Simpson, who is a character and a straight-talking uh, former senator, gave us the formula to bring this economy growing, not by borrowing money, but by growing through the greatness of our private sector. 
and I think with some partnership and incentives from government. But that blueprint, supported by 63% of the commission that President Obama appointed, including two liberal Democrats, Dick Durbin, the senator from Illinois, last time I looked, that's President Obama's home state, that's a liberal Democrat. Kent Conrad, who I believe has a wife who works for a great law firm out of Cleveland, Baker Hotstetler. Kent Conrad also voted for the Simpson-Bowles recommendations. That is substantial cuts in spending, substantial increases in revenues through closing tax loopholes, cutting the corporate tax rate, and entitlement reform. A little bit of pain, a little bit of bad medicine on all sides. And then on the conservative side, Senator Tom Coburn from Oklahoma, probably the most conservative senator in the United States Senate, and Senator Mike Crapo from Idaho, supported raising revenues of over a trillion dollars by closing tax loopholes, and supported a progressive system of changing Medicare so it's more need-based, and Social Security increasing the retirement age over the next 26 years by one year from 67 to 68, and then the next 28 years, another year. Yet that has become a third rail proposal. Even though when Social Security was passed, the average age uh, of, of those of us who will pass was 69 years old in 1935. It's now close to 80. Retiring, uh, erasing the retirement age by a little more than one and a half years over 40 years is a third rail if you bring that up in front of certain Democratic Party groups. You're attacking Social Security, you're pushing grandma over the cliff. This is the kind of non-conversation, food fight rhetoric that has created the dysfunction in Washington. And anybody who's sanctimonious on the left in blaming the right or vice versa is between the 20 yard line and the goalpost. And the rest of us, somewhere in the center left and the center right, are more and more disgusted by this type of behavior by people we elect to serve us in Washington. So I come down to a very simple proposition. When I was uh, coming of age in politics, President Nixon was president, and although I didn't support him, he did come up with a phrase that I hate to repeat because it evokes some bad memories, but it was the real majority. And while I resented the use of that word and that expression in the 1960s because it sounded very divisive, it's us versus them, I think of it now as uniting because there is a majority between the left and the center somewhere that wants to solve problems and believes that there is compromise and consensus that can get Washington working again. I can only tell you what people who were there tell me, and one of them is Chris Matthews, who's a commentator on MSNBC, has his own show, who worked for Tip, Tip O'Neill, pretty darn liberal speaker of the House of Representatives in the 1970s and 80s. And there was a pretty darn conservative president at the time named Ronald Reagan. And Tip O'Neill would be on the floor of the House bashing Reagan's policies, and Reagan would be at the pulpit in the White House bashing Tip O'Neill. As soon as the day was over, Tip O'Neill would get into his car, he'd go to the back of the White House, go up the stairs to the residence, and they would toast a few, and they would talk business, and they talked about the future insolvency of Social Security. And Reagan said to Tip, maybe after the second or third one, why don't we fix this? And Tip said, okay, Mr. President, we both have to take a hit, hold our hands, and jump in the pool together. And that's what they did. They increased taxes on withholding taxes under Social Security, FICA, in order to make Social Security solvent. And Tip O'Neill agreed to increase the retiring age from 65 to 67 and to reduce benefits at upper income levels. That was a tough one for Tip. He had the AARP and a lot of uh, Democratic Party based people saying, don't you dare. But Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan led way ahead of their bases. They alienated their bases. There was anger in their bases. There still is to this day. I hear Republican conservatives when I do Fox. Anyone hear of Fox? <laughs> uh, 
still angry with Ronald Reagan for that deal, but they saved Social Security at least for one generation. Now we're at the precipice again, and we need that kind of leadership from our president, and we need that kind of leadership from our leaders in Congress. And since I'm a Democrat, I feel a heavier responsibility to talk to the president who I supported and who I want to succeed. And I didn't support him when he ran in the primaries. I supported a lady named Hillary Clinton. But I do support President Obama. But I am telling you as a loyal Democrat and supporter of President Obama, he is the president. It doesn't do to tell me I didn't support Simpson Bowles because it was dead on arrival. If Franklin Roosevelt had that attitude, there would never have been the first 100 days. And if Tip O'Neill had that attitude and, and Ronald Reagan, we never would have reformed Social Security. He has to lead. And I believe that he missed an opportunity during the presidential campaign. And I must say, I wrote a column in USA Today in which I challenged him to do this. Turn to Mitt Romney and say, OK, right here on national television, the country is watching. Let's get our books in order. I'll support Simpson Bowles. Will you? And sit down. Now, Mitt Romney was not a great candidate. In that first debate, he might have actually ended up being elected president had he continued as he did in that first debate. But that would have been the end of the campaign if he didn't do anything in response to a challenge. He's a fiscal conservative. Why wouldn't he support a bipartisan commission to, to balance our books at some point in the future? So I hope, and I don't know if I'm uh, almost at the end of, I'm OK. I hope that our president has to lead. Speaker Boehner, Senator McConnell on the Republican side, they have to come to the table, and they haven't in a way that I think they need to. And two Republicans that I greatly respect, Rob Portman, your senator, put aside the fact that he worked for me when he was a young man, so I'm a little bit biased, was on the gang of, um, excuse me, the super committee. And I went to see Rob, and without uh, embarrassing him, he is a very, very thoughtful conservative who was ready to do the right thing and couldn't find a partner on the Democratic side. And I went to my congressman, Chris Van Hollen, I went to Rob Portman, and I said, the two of you can break this tie and make history. And they both said, we need the leadership Rob said we need the leadership on the Republican side. Congressman Holland said we need Speaker Pelosi and President Obama. And they did, because without the leadership, they couldn't have gotten it through either house of, of, of the Congress. But I think the one person who cannot have the excuse, I can't be successful, we need the leadership, is the man who is our leader. There's only one president, and he can lead and can make history. Running for re-election is one thing. Running for history is quite another. So with all due respect, I'm not sure whether President Obama, who's doing a great job on his trip to Israel, and I'm very proud of what he's doing there, is listening. But uh, somehow, I write a lot. I write a column called Purple Nation. I hope all of you will join with me in talking to your Republican friends and your Democratic friends and say we can disagree, but the country is more important than our disagreements. Let's find. Uh, common ground, which I hope uh, we will continue to do here in the state of Ohio and across the country. So now, if you don't mind me making a shameless segue over to a book I wrote, <laughs> there is something in common between the book that I wrote and what I just talked to you about, and that's how to solve a crisis. Uh, I write about true stories from uh, Martha Stewart calling me in the middle of the night saying, I hate my blankety-blank lawyers. Can you help me? Because my lawyers won't let me speak to representing the Penn State Board of Trustees when they had done a very difficult thing in removing a beloved coach, and they wanted to tell their story, and their lawyers were concerned with a criminal proceeding and civil actions that were inevitable. There was concern that if they tell their stories, it would prejudice their legal case. So my book is a true-to-life, first-person narrative about what to do when you're caught in the in the great dilemma between lawyers advising caution and speaking to the media and your reputation and your brand and your sense of self in the case of Gene Upshaw, the head of the National 
Football League Players Association under brutal attack by retired players. In the case of Senator Trent Lott, when he first called me, he was already gone. The Republicans had already thrown him over the side for a very insensitive remark and talking about Strom Thurmond maybe should have been president. In all of these cases, the first thing when I'm doing this uh, very new discipline of combining law practice, public relations, and politics in a three-legged stool that nobody's really tried before, my first response, my first advice from President Clinton all the way through my uh, recent representation of Penn State is one answer, and it does segue back to my earlier topic, and that is, let's start with the facts. You cannot delete facts. You cannot ignore facts. You, if there are bad facts, they're not going away. A lot of people in the middle of a crisis will say, I I'm not going to comment now. I don't want to feed the press. They're going to get it wrong anyway. This is a bad story. Why would you want to help the press write a bad story? A certain president of the United States once said that to me. Why are you helping these guys kill me politically? My answer is because bad facts will not go away. They will dribble out sooner or later. If you do it yourself and put them out yourself, if you did wrong, step up to the line and admit it and fix the problem. One way or another, this is coming out. That's what I say to my clients. To my fellow lawyers, I say, I won't say anything that's going to absolutely hurt your case, but I might say something that's coming out anyway that's a bad fact that you as a great lawyer are going to have to handle at some point. Let's do it ourselves now and save the company, save the brand, save the reputation, and worry about winning the case next day. So that's the very stress-free life I've chosen. <laughs> and uh, my, my memories of friendships made when you're in the trenches together and all the incoming missiles I did have one representation that I tell about in my book, Representative Charles Rangel made some terrible mistakes and suffered for it with a censure on the floor of the House. My advice to him initially was, step up to the line, Charlie. I know him for many years. It's going to be painful. You may lose your position as chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. He hadn't paid his taxes from a condominium that had proceeds distributed. My Cousin Larry is a great accountant, by the way. I recommend his services. <laughs> so Larry, this was a uh, distribution of proceeds from a foreign condominium that he owned for 20 years, and he never got any statements from the Dominican Republic government. And he kind of noticed that the mortgage was going down, but he didn't pay it much attention. 20, 20 years later, the New York Times did pay it attention and decided that he owed the grand sum of $10,000 over 20 years. And it was negligence and carelessness, but it was not corrupt. And so when he came to me, I said, Charlie, let's call a press conference, put out your tax returns, write the check for $10,000, and plead guilty to carelessness. But you've never made a dime. You've never taken a bribe. There's no corruption here. You were just damn careless. And he took my advice, held a press conference, and he called himself grossly negligent, which is the legal part of his brain speaking. And we thought that was over. But I said to him, Charlie, we need to do a scrub of all your financial statements, because if you were careless about this, you might have been careless about some of the transactions over 20, 30 years in public life. And it was at that point that he was fed up with the media. He had done his humiliating, I was grossly negligent, and he didn't want to do anymore. And that was the end of my uh, representation. And sure enough, his house filings contained omissions, let us say, that ended up not being all that serious, but it was just the Chinese water torture of one too many bad facts. And his lawyers, rather than getting him to acknowledge the issue, started to be litigators. And fellow lawyers in the room, I'm one of you. I litigated for 30 years. When we get into that framework, we're bad, B-A-A-D. We need to settle cases so our clients win. And by settling cases, sometimes it means acknowledging wrongdoing. In the legal arena, you really can't do that because you have an obligation to fight for your client. In the political arena, if I had a bad document that I discovered working for President Clinton, I would pick up the telephone, find a reporter, and say, come on in. I have a really bad document to show you. 
If I were a lawyer doing that, I'd be guilty of malpractice, because really you can't do that. But as, as someone representing the President of the United States, I wanted that bad story to be written that I put out with my explanation. And when it came time for a national televised hearing by Senator Fred Thompson, the movie actor, became a senator, and Congressman Dan Burton from nearby, uh, uh, very, very um, sweet gentleman. No, he wasn't. Uh, <laughs> not about Bill Clinton. They wanted to break these stories on national television. I think Fred Thompson was ready to run for president based upon the headlines that he would have created. By the time he held those nationally televised hearings, those stories had been written. I had handed them out, or should I say leaked them out, and they were done. So I was in the hallway while Senator Thompson's on national television talking about his newest revelation about the Clinton White House, and I was handing out the articles that had already been written three months before telling the reporters, old news, been there, done that. And at one point, we missed one that we forgot to leak. And Senator Thompson said on national television, one of my proudest moments, today we're talking about a topic that even Lanny Davis won't say is old news. <laughs> <laughs> so in, uh, in conclusion, I think I'm almost at the end of my time. Uh, Ohio is a critical state for winning the presidency. I'm sure you all felt uh, almost ground zero in the year 2000, 2004, 2008, 2012. I have a feeling that in 2016, if a certain friend of mine decides to run for president, and I don't know whether she will or not, <laughs> but I can tell you she came to my book party about a week ago, and we were friends since the days her name was Rodham. She's the best friend I've ever had. Uh, she's a girl, but she's a friend. <laughs> she's smart, she works hard, she's kind, she's funny. She's one of the funniest people I ever met, but she certainly is the best friend anyone could ever have. America got to know her a little better, not running for president, but being Secretary of State, and the world got to know her. So I don't know whether she will run. I haven't asked her. If I had my preference, I wish she wouldn't. I wish she would sleep, write books, and enjoy her family. But I do think that Ohio is going to be important again. So if, perchance, she decides to do something, I'll be back and you'll be hearing me talking about my friend Hillary. Thank you all very much. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Lanny Davis, lawyer, political consultant, and crisis manager. We will return to our speaker momentarily for the traditional City Club questions and answers. Please begin to formulate your questions now and remember to make them brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those listening on 90.3 WCPN, IdeaStream, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Closed captioning of our program is provided by the Nordson Corporation. We welcome today guests at a table hosted by Baker Hostetler. Thank you for your support. Travel considerations for today's programs are provided by United Airlines, the official airline of the City Club. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphone in the audience today is Program Director Kerry Miller. May we have the first question, please. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, my question has to do with politics in Washington, of course, but a question that I think is very, very important. Uh, President Obama is in the Middle East, and I heard his speech yesterday, and I loved it. I thought it was great. But uh, I, uh, there is a fact, you know, they, they, uh, they, they want the peace, uh, and I think a sure way to get them and do away with things like building in East Jerusalem or whatever, if they got rid of the nukes in such a way that there can be no bombing of Israel, you would have peace before you say Jack Robinson. Well, I wish it were that simple, but um, I think that President uh, Obama and the Western world, and certainly Prime Minister Netanyahu agrees that when you have a country that sponsors 
openly and doesn't deny terrorism. In Iran, driven by vitriol and hatred, not only towards America, but towards Western values and civilization, and then says to a neighboring state, we aim to exterminate you. Americans uh, just have to imagine what it would be like if we had a hostile government like Iran that was Canada rather than Canada with a nuclear uh, capability almost ready to be developed with the head of the country saying, I'm going to exterminate America. We would have what is called in Israel a sense of existential threat, meaning our existence is literally at risk. So we have to find a way uh, to hold that red line without military intervention, which would be a disaster. The sanctions regime has started to hurt, but I think at some point uh, President Obama has quite bravely said, as has the Prime Minister of Israel, as had most Western European leaders, uh, if Iran, with this type of government that has declared war on Western civilization in supporting terrorists, that's what it is. When you support people who celebrate death, who can justify killing innocent children for political goals, whatever they may be, or religious theology, whatever it may be, uh, that is a challenge to, to civilization, not just Western civilization. Uh, Iran is an enemy of civilized humanity. And the Arab states, the Sunni states in the Gulf, uh, are just as much threatened by Iran as is Israel. Indeed, they may feel more threatened because of the sectarian division between Shiites and Sunnis. It might actually be worse than the hatred towards Israel. So I hope that President Obama, who has shown great leadership uh, and better now than four years ago, I think that uh, we have some hope that with that sign of strength that Iran will at least for its own sake uh, take a step back and, and return to civilization and stop supporting Hamas, Hezbollah, and terrorist groups that believe in some type of uh, purpose in killing innocent people. Since we're sort of uh, looking toward Washington, what is the role of the Tea Party? Because if you look at the news, if they're both raised and <laughs> criticized. Well, I don't know if there is a Tea Party. There is a movement of people with different principles. But I don't think there's an organized party as we think of that in the United States and the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. There are people who have strong views and they're legitimate. Some of them are on the fringe and Democrats try to label the entire movement as defined by the most fringe people. But these are people with very legitimate viewpoints, uh, certainly on taxes and spending and balanced budgets. You've heard me speak to many of those principles, which Tea Party uh, adherents with those principles that I think the Tea Party uh, stand for would agree with. Some of the more uh, extreme uh, scenes that we've seen after the health care bill was passed in the hateful town meetings that the entire Tea Party movement was labeled with is just as unfair is when some of the more extreme people on my side of the fence speak, and I'm blamed for that. So I, I grant them a great deal, uh, the people that I see involved in this movement. It is a grassroots movement. We have the history of America having grassroots movements. The populist movement is a straight line from populism that was called radical and, and um, very dangerous in the 1880s and 1890s, became the Democratic Party of the 1930s. The Republican Party has to return to its traditional conservative principles and it lost uh, those roots. I think you're seeing Marco Rubio, Jeb Bush, and somebody who's a hero to me in this uh, world of conversation rather than food fighting is John McCain. Another is Lindsey Graham. So there are many Republicans who are sort of where we were after 1972, where Democrats need to reclaim the party of the middle class instead of party of interest groups. That's what happened to us in 72. The Republicans are going through the same thing and I think they'll have a formidable uh, set of candidates running for president in 2016. Uh, Mr. Davis, you've had a, a vast experience in the media, both in radio and television and print. And I noticed from the program notes today that you're a frequent contributor to Fox News. Uh, could you evaluate for us uh, what you feel is the, how would you rate the objectivity of Fox News? Well, it's, it's great being on uh, Sean Hannity's show and Bill O'Reilly's show 
are the two that I think of, because I don't really need to do very much. They ask the questions and they answer the questions. <laughs> To be fair, Bill O'Reilly uh, consistently allows me to answer, and then he talks over me. Uh, Sean Hannity asks the question, and as I start to answer, he answers the question. Uh, you know, Fox um, is run by an absolutely great man named Roger Ailes, who had a vision. And the vision is that there was a vacuum. He saw the vacuum in the center right of the country in the mass media. For right or wrong, he brilliantly found an audience. And he does have people like me who are off the party line of conservative Republicans. And he does give me an opportunity. And it was Roger Ellis himself who signed me up. And I do have great respect for Sean Hannity, who happens to be a very nice man. He's very nice because he's a fan of Seth Davis's. So, uh, so I do get my share of um, speaking to a very large audience. It's twice or three times the audience of all the other cable stations combined. And half of the audience are Democrats. It's not all Republicans watching Fox. So I get a chance to tell people in the middle to the right of middle uh, what my viewpoints are. And I, oh, it's all I want. I don't expect people to agree with me. I think MSNBC is on the other side. And they've seen a, a gap of programming from the left side of the spectrum. I miss having a hard news place to go. Uh, I think Fox does a better job of hard news in the evening than does MSNBC, which is all programming and all entertaining and all politics. But I do think that uh, CNN, under the leadership of somebody I've known for many years named Jeff Zucker, uh, has a, a vacuum of a good hard news station that it can build up an audience around, and I wish them well. I'm loyal to Fox and Roger Ailes, but I certainly hope that CNN comes back so we do have a broad cross-section of, of choices as, as viewers. Boy, have I just covered the waterfront or what? <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to get uh, your take a little bit further on the thesis that people should come clean and bring out the news right away. And I'd like you to apply it to, and maybe you already have in your book, I, I've got to admit I have not read your book, um, apply it to the Monica Lewinsky situation. Uh, my sense is that when President Clinton obfuscated about his relationship with Monica Lewinsky, it helped him in two respects. One, it helped him rally the Democrats. The Democrats, you know, as it went over several months, they rallied behind him. And secondly, I think people started thinking, well, is his personal relationship with Monica Lewinsky something that for which he should be impeached or removed from office or even should resign? Whereas I think if he admitted right up front that he, he had had a relationship with Monica Lewinsky, I'm not sure we'd have a President Clinton that would have completed his term. Uh, what is your take on that situation? Well, this is a painful uh, question because it's so personal. But my book is called Crisis Tales, Five Rules for Coping with Crises in Business, Politics, and Life. And the situation that President Clinton faced is about life more than politics. He had a relationship with, as I said, one of the great people I've ever met who happened to be his wife, who he loved deeply and who he had hurt and he knew that he had. A lot of his friends uh, tried to imagine that it hadn't happened. So there was a sense of denial. Maybe it really didn't happen. And it took President Clinton a while to have the inner strength to do what is in private life. Forget about being president in front of 200 million people admitting to this. If it's a private situation between yourself and a wife, a companion, a friend, it's a really, really hard thing to do. And he had to do it publicly in front of the whole country. So when I give advice to corporations, to politicians, about not filing your financial statements, not paying your taxes, having an accounting irregularity that the SEC is investigating, all of these subjects are easier to follow my advice than this one. This one, everybody in some way gets the weakness, man and woman, the human weakness that led to this behavior and the difficulty of telling the truth. And people in Washington were offended by the length of time it took President Clinton to tell the truth. When he finally did, he suffered great pain 
before he did, I can tell you that. When he finally did, it was just an ultimately painful thing to watch any man or woman being that uh, honest about such a difficult subject. But it was very, very late in the day, didn't follow my immediate rule, get the bad facts out. But all I can tell you is, uh, even as a friend, much less as an advisor, I constantly kept in mind, there but for the grace. And there is uh, a very religious rule about uh, don't judge the sinner, but forgive the sinner. And I think the American people got that quickly, that his job in office was a distinction between the wrongful behavior. They could forgive the wrongful behavior, especially when he apologized. But they were able to make that distinction certainly earlier than I was, because I was all worried about him being impeached. Sooner or later, the topic changed from the wrongful behavior to the excessive political partisan reaction of the Republicans in trying to use that horrible instance of personal weakness as a source to remove him as president. American people not only opposed that, but in the immediate election after the impeachment, for the first time in many, many years, the sitting president gained seats in Congress. And despite that, the impeachment proceeded with lame duck people who had been defeated in their districts providing the margin of difference on that impeachment vote. My friend John Kasich, if you're listening, and I'm off the radio, so you'll have to tell him I said this, I forgive you. A lot of friends of mine, Republicans, deeply believe that he should have been impeached. I respect their uh, sincerity. I just uh, ended up with the American people, 23 million jobs, and a 65% approval rating on his last day in office, despite everything, kind of means that the American people were wiser than a lot of the politicians in Washington. Uh, Lanny, uh, teenagers today are very sophisticated. And they say that their number one influence is friends, and number two is media. It's no longer school, religion, family, etc. So, you know, they watch us very intently. And they watch politicians, um, and they watch the media intently. Uh, so they see the division and the divisiveness and the self-interest and so on and so forth, and that kind of sets the example for them. We have another example that was set here in Cleveland that's a model for our country with the collaboration between Mayor Jackson and school CEO Eric Gordon and Governor Kasich and David Kolke, the head of the Cleveland Teachers Union, and the reason why that occurred was because they put their values first. They didn't put the vision first. They put their values first. In other words, kids in education have to be first. And number two, collaboration has to be first. So my question is, how do we project that as a model and get other politicians and the news media to put values first to say, this is what I stand for, whether it be integrity, et cetera, et cetera, and to collaborate more? Well, in every... Um experiment from um, the Skinner box when I was a freshman at Yale. The professor challenged us in a bet that he could prove that a rat was smarter than every Yale student in the room. And he said, how much do you want to bet? So of course, we all were egotistical male, which is, my wife would say, that's a redundant expression, egotistical male. Uh, we all thought, of course, we're smarter than a rat. So he set up the Skinner box, which is, and he's, those of you forget your, your days in psychology, is uh, there's an electric shock on the left of the T at the end of a passage and a whole bunch of delicious rat food on the right side. And he told us, look, I'm going to favor one side over the other, but I'm not going to tell you when I have food on, when I, when I have uh, electricity. They'll, they'll be on the same side, but I'm not going to tell you when I switch. Uh, and you're going to have to compete with the rat as to how many times you're right in guessing where the food is and how many times you're wrong. So um, after 100 trials, we all kept track up to 100. He collected all the ballots. And he gave us the, um, the, the rat's score was like 68% right. The highest score of any human egotistical male in the place was before Rick Taft did his work to bring females. I think. <laughs> Females would have gotten this because they're more instinctual than us analytic uh, solution-solving males that drive our wives crazy. I had a bad day today, dear. Oh, really? Let me fix your problem. I decided that's a bad thing to say. 
Uh, we were in the 50s. So the rat got 68%, we got 50s. Anyone here want to tell me what the secret is to why the rat does better? Every time, always, not nose. The rat doesn't try to outsmart the professor. The rat figures out sooner or later which side's going to have the food more often than which side's going to have the shock. And he says, maybe not consciously, the heck with guessing when the switch is, I'm going to go with the odds. The human being thinks, I'm going to figure this out and I'm going to guess when the switch is so I can beat the other guy. And so you're going to be wrong more often. The rat goes with the average. So getting back to your question, <laughs> how do I possibly segue back to your question? I just talked about a rats in the Skinner box. We have to reward, that's what I was really driving at, good behavior. The rat got rewarded by deciding the heck with guessing where I'm going to turn. I'm going to go with the food and get the highest average. We have to reward politicians like John Kasich, who are willing to come to Cleveland, work with a Democratic mayor. He's a Democratic mayor, right? Thank you. And we have to reward as voters, and we have to penalize opposite behavior. Now, do we do that? I'm sorry to say we don't do that. Many of us vote the party line, myself included. If I voted for a Republican, my father in heaven would have my you-know-what. But I swear I'm going to uh, try to change. <laughs> so we've got to reinforce the good behavior. And when Republicans and Democrats sit down together, we have to vote for them and not reinforce the behavior where they're not talking. And what's going on here in Ohio and in Cleveland should be reinforced by Democrats and Republicans who vote and who express themselves positively. How did I get from a Skinner box to answer that question? I have no idea. Mr. Davis, your theory sounds so s simple, and it seems to be so appropriate on an intellectual level. But, and, and you indicate that, that the president has to lead on this thing. Well, they, well, hasn't he already in some of the other aspects in trying to resolve this financial crisis? And why has it always broken down? Well, you can't blame him entirely, and you can't blame the Republicans entirely. So the easy answer is it's both of their faults and none of their faults. So I prefer to say uh, it's our fault, because they're politicians, we're voters. They're trained, I have to keep going back to that rat, they're trained to respond to stimuli that's positive reinforcement uh, or negative. And we voters have allowed this behavior to continue. President Obama has tried. And at some point, he and Speaker Boehner were this close. And then it broke apart. Some of it is institutional. You have members of Congress that don't care about the general election because their districts are one-party districts. They're never going to lose in the general election. All they're worried about is a primary to their flank. So uh, Democrats worry to the left flank. Republicans worry to their right flank. That means when they're elected, they don't really care about the center because they've got a lock on re-election. And they rarely uh, have conversations, social uh, occasions with Democrats. I've been in Washington for 40 years, and I can't tell you how discouraging it is to hear members on both sides say, I don't have any Democrats to talk to. And if I'm seen talking to a Democrat, I might be ostracized in my party caucus. Just think how terrible that is. These are people supposed to be representing us. So I think the answer has to come back to us as voters. What is not acceptable any longer is this stalemate. And we've got to tell our politicians, I don't care about your ideology, and I don't care about your caucus. You've got to compromise. And I would start with the budget as a place where we had Democrats and Republicans on the Simpson-Bowles Commission ready to compromise. And why we didn't demand that commission's recommendations as a, as a people on both President Obama and uh, Governor Romney, that's when we really had them. They needed us then, right? That was the time, and so I hope that we'll just remember it all comes back to we're a democracy. We have to speak to our elected officials. Fo following up on that, I mean, one of the problems we have, is, as you pointed out, is, is the divisiveness, uh, the, the polarization, uh, and it's done through the redistricting process. Yes. What can we do to try and, is there a way to try and fix that? Because that's really what allows these people to just get through the primary and then go in and not have to worry about talking to anybody on the other side. It's a great question, and if it's my last one, it'll give you something to think about. There are certain states in the United States who have solved this problem. Anyone here from Iowa or with roots in Iowa? 
Long time ago, Iowa took the redistricting process out of politics and took it to an independent commission that would actually do it fairly without political considerations, that where the population centers were what looked to be contiguous rational districts. And the gerrymandered districts that are almost comical. In my own state of Maryland, there's a district they created to elect a Democrat. Uh, I lost my congressman. I have a new Democratic congressman, but it looks like somebody was drunk when they were drawing it. It's just like all, uh, that kind of thing is what's the trouble. So an independent commission, Governor Kasich, leaders of your legislature here in Ohio, let's do it. You should begin that, and maybe you'll get through to them. Thank you. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring Lanny Davis, lawyer, political consultant, and crisis manager. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. Thank you. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. PNC is proud to support the presentation of this City Club of Cleveland Friday Forum on WVIZ PBS. Additional support comes from Cleveland State University. Support for closed caption transcripts of City Club forums is provided by the Nordson Corporation Foundation.